Okay, everyone, we have just clicked over to 6.05. Um, so we'll we'll get this seminar formally underway. I would like on behalf of ASHA to welcome everyone to the seminar. My name is Siobhan Lavelle and I'm currently the president of ASHA. Um, but tonight's seminar is part of the ongoing ASHA online seminar series. So we're very pleased to have everybody join us. I'm on the land of the Darug and Gundungurra people and ASHA acknowledges the traditional owners of country and recognises their continuing connection to land, seas, waters and communities. Recognising where we stand is but one of many acts acknowledging past injustices and committing to acts of reconciliation. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, to other First Nations peoples on the lands on which we meet this evening and to Elders past and present. Um, we're very lucky tonight that our seminar is being presented by Dr. James Robinson from Heritage New Zealand. Um, and I'm sure those of you who booked for this seminar actually read the Precy on the website, but James is an archeologist, historian and archivist, and he's particularly experienced in landscape archeology. span And he's going to speak with us tonight about research that he's done about Maori settlement on Tawiti Rahi or the Poor Knights Island. Um, so without further ado, I'll let um, James get going. And I should also just mention that he is also a member of the ASHA Executive Committee. So over to you, Dr. Robinson. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming and joining us today. Um, today, I'm going to talk about my doctoral research, which was on uh, the Tafiri Rahi or the Poor Knights Islands and uh, off Northland's east coast of New Zealand. And, uh, uh, and I would like to give thanks to the Ngāti Wai Trust Board. They are the, the iwi or the tribal group that have traditional uh, connection to this area. They're the traditional owners, if you want to put it that way, of these islands and places along the coast. I also give thanks to Department of Conservation who currently manage these islands and provided access. Landcare Research, who carried out the pollen palynology, which allowed us to reconstruct the vegetation, and the University of Otago, where it allowed me to do this piece of research. Um, the key thing about this is that it's a multidisciplinary study. As you can see, it's an environmental earth science, archaeology, and history. And I just want you to bear in mind that each of these databases always has strengths and weaknesses. And if you only had one, you'd end up with a, an interpretation of the past, which would be, uh, uh, which doesn't always con be consistent with the other two. And so what you have to do is weave a story that is consistent with all three of those. And you end up with a much richer interpretation of the past because of those constraints. So in a sense, we're dealing with a seascape. Uh, islands and coasts provide a maritime environment for human settlement that can be seen as a seascape rather than a landscape. And things like circumscriptions and constraints and opportunities associated with islands can create what I refer to as presence and absence scenarios that are often, if you're lucky, visible in the archaeology. These types of scenarios are present in all landscape archaeology, but for archaeologists, archaeologists they're more visible in seascapes. And I will get into that a little bit later. So the research questions are very simple. Who settled Tafiri Rahi, the islands, the Poor Knights Islands? When, was, when, when were the islands settled? And why were the islands settled? And we're using history, environmental earth science, and archaeology to approach these questions. So, there's a, an early chart of New Zealand that uh, I believe comes from one of the uh, uh, one of the Cook charts. You can see Northland is the top or the uh, tail of the fish to Ika a Maui. And you can see Cape, Cape North at the top, coming all the way down to East Cape. So we're in this northern area, which is important because it's in the horticultural zone, which was the key determinant for population numbers in New Zealand. So here's a, a look. You can see the Three Kings Islands, which were visited by uh, Abel Tasman in 1649. And then a whole series of little islands down the East Coast, which is known as the Women's Sea, because it's much more benign than the West Coast, all the way down to Whale Island. And these islands are 
referred to as you know the kings, cavallis, poor knights, hen and chickens. The big one is Great Barrier, and then you have Mercury. You can see the Mercury Islands, and then you get the Aldermans, and then those three arrows down the bottom. The top one is uh, out to a place called Mare Island. Now, Mare Island is really important in New Zealand's early prehistory. With the arrival of Polynesian navigators circa 1300, they, within the first living generation, had circumnavigated the island and found most of the stone and other resources in New Zealand. And one of the key resources they found was obsidian, the volcanic glass. And from Mare Island, you will find that in nearly all early settlement sites, there will be a preponderance of Mare Island obsidian. Later, when tribal groups increased in number, you find that local sources of obsidian uh, increased in significance and Mare Island reduced to being a, a, a regional source. So it's a useful time indicator. You find lots of Mare Island obsidian, you should have an early site. That's the sort of rough idea we have in New Zealand archaeology. So here we have the Poor Knights. The image on the left here, you can see the Northland coast. There's Whangarei, the major harbour, and all sorts of uh, little bays down this coast. And then there's the Poor Knights, named by Cook, for a variety of reasons that's a, 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 an interesting story in its own right, but we won't get into it. Um, there's the two main islands, Tafiri Rahi to the north, Aorangi to the south, and Aorangai is this little offshore island. My research was on Tafiri Rahi. So it's the northernmost and largest island in the group, and it basically has these, uh, uh, this plateau area here, and then it drops down to a uh, a lower area here where one of the very few landing sites are localized. If you look closely, you can actually see the vegetation is a different color here. And that was due to a major fire that occurred in the 1920s and 30s, 20s or 30s. Um, and that's relevant for the pollen uh, information I'll get to. So the topography, it is girt with cliffs. It's very dramatic. Some of the cliffs are 200 meters tall. It, on the eastern side, it's open to the sea, uh, and it's uh, getting very rough there. There's, um, as you can see, it's uh, it's a, a rhyolitic volcanic island with about three million years old, and it's got lots of these little stacks all the way around it. The vegetation is quite thick at the moment. It's uh, slowly thinning out. The canopy of Pahutakawa, the native New Zealand Christmas tree, uh, provides a, a, a dense canopy and it's starting to shade out a lot of the understory and the vegetation history on this island differed from Aorangi because it never had European pigs introduced to it which changed the understory but as you can see not an easy island to survey. Uh, you get native trees like the Miru where you can actually see the berries growing on it and you normally don't get that on the mainland because the rats that are a commensal of Polynesian arrival uh, uh, normally will eat those before it gets to that stage. But this island, one of the absence scenarios is they don't have the, the Polynesian rat. And that's very rare in those offshore islands. And here we're on one of the high points uh, with one of the surveys, Ivan Bruce and myself, and it's it's hard to see anything. We have uh, rare and endangered fauna here, which was of interest to scientists in the early 1900s, which led to being declared a, a, a scientific reserve. This is a tuatara. And as I was saying earlier to my colleagues, you can see it's got a double tail because they're like certain skinks where if they lose a tail, they grow a new one. In this case, he got a cut on the side of his tail and grew a new tail out of it. I have seen one tuatara with five branches in their tail because once you get one branch, chances you're going to get more cuts. And eventually the tail pops off and they start all over again. These are very ancient animals. Uh, and one of their survival tricks is to live longer than anything else. So they can live, some of these are probably still alive at the time of Captain Cook's visit or Lieutenant Cook's visit in 1769. You have these, again, rare uh, uh, giant wetters. And it's the breeding ground of the Buller Shearwater, which was one of the mutton birds, one of the 12 species of, of, of um, uh, sort of albatross related birds, which leave their young in a state of covered in fluffy down and full of uh, fish tasting fat. 
which was a huge resource for, for Māori all around the country. These were known as rako in, the, uh, in this particular area, and they were renowned for being particularly large and tasty, so it was a major resource for Māori. We also have giant centipedes. A lot of these species just don't survive on the mainland because of rats. It also has the East Australian current that comes down, and we get billfish like wahoo and stuff turning up, but it also has coastal fisheries as well, so we get the, some of the highest biomass of fish in the country. Um, uh, and it is a marine reserve, so there's thousands of fish, which is quite uh, amazing. And because it has very little runoff due to the island, basically water falling through the island, there's no sediment. So if you ever want to go diving there, you'll see for 100 meters and all the different fish. So traditional history. So Taitokra, or the Māori word for Northland, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's within the territory or rohe of Ngātiwai, who are the people of the sea, and then we'll talk about the islands. So here's a context of Ngātiwai history in relatively recent periods. You can see the image on the right. You've got the confederation of tribes known as Napui and Tirarawa here, and then the confederation of tribes known as Ngāti Whātua down here. And then you've got Ngātiwai sort of stuck in the middle. Ngātiwai are a group that's connected by descent links and extend along the Northland coast and out to Great Barrier Island. They're kin relations with both Napui and Ngāti Whātua, but um, various sub-hapu within those tribe would have conflicts with various other groups uh, in, in quite complex interactions. Sometime in the 1900s, Napui began to advance into the Bay of Islands and down in towards Whangarei, and Ngāti Wai in particular were under pressure from them, and there was a movement by them out to Great Barrier, Aotea, and um, and we know about this in the 1820s, and that's relevant to the settlement on the Poor Knights when we get to it. So as you can see, here's Ngāti Wai's territory overlapping Napui and Ngāti Whātua's territory. Close up, you can see there's the Poor Knights Islands. There's Maratiri and Taranga, which is the hen and chicken islands. There's the Mokahino Islands. There's Hauturu Little Barrier and Aotea Great Barrier. And for in terms of obsidian, uh, we find uh, Whakapara and Huruiki obsidians that are useful on the mainland here. We find Mokahino obsidian, and we find two sources of Aotea Great Barrier obsidian. That's in addition to Mare Island, which is 256 kilometers to the south. And as I mentioned earlier, the sea is known as Tai Tamahine, or the Woman's Sea. It's also known as Te Moana Nui o Toi Te Tuatahi, or the Sea of, it's the Sea of Toi Te Tuatahi, or the Floats of Toi Te Tuatahi. And these are ancient names that have survived connecting to the two homelands back in the Pacific. So we have some interesting traditions. <clears throat> they were named after islands back in the Pacific. So Tafiti Rahi is probably like a Tahiti type name. There are places on the adjacent mainland where there are kumara pits. These are the climatic food storage pits for the, for the sweet potato, which can't survive our winters unless they're in these places. And some of those kumara pits at Fononaki on the immediate coast were referred to as being belonging to the people on the poor nights. And that's showing connections between the mainland and islands. At Fongaruru Harbour on the mainland, there is a wahitapu at a pass site that is reputed to contain the bodies of locals killed during an attack by Poor Knights Islanders. So that's evidence of conflict between mainland and islands. And then at a certain point in time, a Ngāti Waihapu or subtribe led by a rangatira chief Titatua from Fononaki and his wife Te Oniho from Takahiwai in the Whangarei Harbour moved out to the island of uh, of Tafiti Rahi. And he was the only chief to live on the island. And he was there in the 1820s. And this comes from a native land court uh, transcriptions, which refers to uh, the islands being named early, that an ancestor of Tatatua called Panoa was there at some point in the mid phase, but Tatatua was there in the early 1800s. And his name turns up in association with the famous Rangatira chief, Hongi. Hongi Hika, and he was there with Hongi down at Taupo fighting in the 1822. We know that there is a migration of Ngātiwai in the 1820s from the mainland out to Great Barrier, 
due to the problems of being under pressure from Nati wire. And um, it is possible that there's a battle at Mimifangata on the coast and uh, and and one of the tohonga whakaero, which is, uh, whakaero is carver and tohonga is priest. So in New Zealand, master carvers were are very much respected. And a tohonga master carver is somebody who deals with the spiritual and the physical. And Tiwarahi Hetaraka has an account of people who moved to the islands following a battle on the mainland, which the Natiwai lost. And it could be that Tafiti Rahi was settled in that period of the 1820s or somewhere in the late 1700s to 1820s, if this traditional history is turning up. This particular gentleman on the right is called Hori Wehi Wehi, and he was the son of Chief Tatatua. And there are some interesting traditions about when the islands were attacked, how he was spirited away to a cave, the only cave on the island. And we have things that are consistent with that in the archaeology. He was a key player in land sales on the mainland in the 1860s. So in simple terms, traditional history, the hapu is Ngāti Wai, and they were named early, but chiefly settlement was late. And that's an important thing. And why were, why were they there? Well, gardening, mutton birding, in particular seasonal mutton birding, and defence, probably later, but defence is important. So the history, we have records during Māori occupation, uh, pre-1823, and we have records after Māori occupation ended in 1823. We start with a chart, a manuscript chart from uh, Lieutenant Pickerskill, who was a third lieutenant on the Endeavour with Lieutenant Cook. And for some reason, they drew north to the bottom of their maps. So the image on the left shows, as we would look at it, there's the mainland, there's the poor Knights Islands. So if I re rotate it, you can see the words, the poor, the Knights, named by uh, by Cook, and then he had the elders. So there was some interesting naming stuff going on with Cook. Um, and uh, and so uh, so we, we know they went past, there is the track of the ship, but they didn't get very close and they didn't record any people living on the islands. Then we have this very famous chart. This one on the left is one of only two maps produced by Māori pre-1800 that we have today. And this is a, a, a map by uh, Tuki and Huru. They were kidnapped at the direction of Governor King, who took them, had them taken to Norfolk Island, where he was hoping to get knowledge about how to process the New Zealand flax, which he hoped to develop as a trade for the British Navy, who were at that period of time excluded from the Baltic due to wars and they couldn't get spars, and they couldn't get uh, flax for sails, for linen for sails. So he thought, well, New Zealand flax and, and Norfolk Island pine trees would make spars and sails, except, of course, as you know, the Norfolk Island pine tree has got branches coming out at the same place, so it weakens it. It's not very good. If we look at a close-up on the right here, you can see there's Hauturu. I mentioned that little barrier to you earlier on an earlier map. And then you come up here to the Cavalli Islands, which are... Uh, shown in great detail and talking about Fongaroa with 200, 2,000 fighting men, blah, blah, blah. But here's where the poor knights should be. And there's a big gap. And we're not sure why, but we'll, that's part of the explanation has to take that into account. Then we get historic accounts from 1823. In the Bay of Islands, uh, the mission had moved from Rangihua into the Kerikiri area, but some of the missionaries stayed to farm. And one was, was Mr. King, then resident at Hohi, and he wrote to Reverend Samuel Lee in 1824, stating that in December of the previous year, our natives got possession of the sails of the ship Brampton, which had wrecked in the bay. They cut up the canvas, fitted their canoes with sails, and after taking sufficient force of arms and ammunition, steered for the poor knights. And at that point, the natives, who didn't have muskets with them, uh, were panic stricken and fled in all directions and numbers threw themselves from the cliff and were drowned. And our people pursued the fugitives and continued the work of destruction until they had depopulated the islands. He, ref he writes on the 16th of December, the fighting party came back with slaves and canoes and they made great slaughter of the people. Now, we are, so this gives us a very good um, Bayesian end date for settlement. Uh, Tatatua had been fighting with Hongi 
uh, down in Taupo uh, and presumably took all the men with guns with him. And when he returned, he um, uh, uh, lifted the dead and buried them back at various places on the mainland, presumably connecting to where they had come from, and declared a tapu on the island. And the island was never occupied after that point, though fishing uh, parties did occasionally land on the, the, the coast. Now, after 1823, we have Dumont de Urville's Duperry expedition. Nothing is said about it. They sail past, but don't reference it. In 1827, Dumont de Urville uh, uh, comes again on his own uh, expedition, and he describes the islands and the use of the Māori name Tafati Rahi for the first time. In 1833, HMS Buffalo hove two under the lee of the islands, but found them uh, found them inhabited. There was fires on the southernmost one, which would be Aorangi. Now, in 1844, Joel Polak purchased these islands from Ngātiwai chiefs. And the chart on the left here is his sketch plan, which took a lot of working out. But here is the Northland coast. And then here are the groups of islands. There's Hauturu again. So... Aot uh, is out here somewhere, and you've got Maratiri and uh, and Tihau, and so that's the and Taranga, and so that's the Hen and Chickens, and then you've got these places along the coast, Fononaki, and and stuff like that, and then here's the Mokahinaus, which had obsidian. I told you about that, and here's the group of islands called the Pornites. So, uh, Koponaiti is a is a transliteration of the word poor knights. So by this point in 1844, the Māori name of the poor knights had disappeared from the texts. The fact that it's commonly used by both Māori and Pākehā at this time from the Papatupu books from the Great Barrier suggests that Māori occupation had been, uh, after this point in time, was intermittent, minor or short term, because you, names are useful if you live somewhere. So the presence and absence of names. The island today has many, many Māori names all the way around it. But um, the, the only three with any antiquity are Tafiri Rahi for the Northern Island, Aurangi for the Southern Island, and Aurangaya. All the rest of these names were created by a surveyor, Pikmir, in 1926, when he first surveyed the island. And uh, since he got the hapu on the islands inverted, he calls the central Hill here, Puki Tuaho after the chief Tuaho, and uh, and Puki Tatua on the Aurangi on the southern islands, and that wasn't resolved until the 1928 Māori Land Court records when Hana Pangati sorted it out. So, summarise it: Who? It's only been Māori settlement on these islands with Ngātiwai connections to the Tutukaka coast through Chief Tatua and to the Whangarei Harbour through his wife Te Onoho. When? Well, we historically have no direct evidence of human settlement on the islands prior to 1833, but there's multiple confirmation that Maori settlement ends in December 1823. So we've got a sort of a Bayesian stop on the end date. We're not sure about the early date. The lack of embedded names hints that full settlement was short term. So why? Well, we've got change over time, we think. We think it's always gardens, and I'll get into that in a minute. Mutton birds. Uh, important as, and become increasingly important as the mainland mutton bird colonies get decimated by rats. And there's always fishing. And later on, there was pigs, at least pigs on Aurangi Island. But post-1700, following the need for defence against the depredations of Napui, and this is before the massacre, these islands, which were so difficult to get onto, suddenly were reinterpreted as natural past sites. So let's have a look at the environmental science. So what we're trying to do is reconstruct a vegetation history for some palynology. And then we'll have a little look at the implications of the absence of the Polynesian rat curie and the presence of Sus scroffa scroffa, the domesticated pig, on the southern island. And remember that while the pig was part of the kit of Polynesian animals brought in from the Pacific eastwards, they didn't make it to New Zealand. The only animals that came were kiore and a bunch of tropical crops. So we tried on a number of places to get a pollen core and was successful in the southern area of Tafiti Rahi. 
and we've managed to reconstruct a 1900 year vegetation sequence. And in that sequence, you can see the pollen cores here. There was tephra uh, at the bottom relating to Taupo eruption around uh, 1 to 200 AD. And there was also tephra relating to the Kahawera, Kaharoa eruption, which is uh, 1400 in New Zealand. A very nondescript volcano in the central North Island, but its distinctive tephra is useful because it occurs at pretty much the earliest arrival of humans. So we use it as an independent tasting record. So here we have a vegetation sequence. On the side here, you can see the depth of the, of the core. So 85 centimeters at the bottom through to zero at the top. The vegetation uh, has been pulled from the pollen, which has been identified and counted. And then you repeat that process all the way through. So here you can see um, it's been divided into these zones. So you've got pre-human, early Maori, late Maori, and then the European period but not European settlement. So essentially this line here is the big change. And because I've clustered the vegetation into forest species here and disturbed species here, you can see a dramatic change. At this point here, which is around about 1300, there had been six, at least 600 years of big mature trees. And then as we move up the graph, they start to disappear. And at the same time, the disturbed species start to appear. And then when we come right to the top, you see this particular species of Putakawa, which had been very minor all the way through, suddenly becomes bigger and bigger. And that's the dominant species today. And it's often what happens when islands are abandoned. So the interpretation of this is that it's a, a proxy for human arrival, pre-human. And then when humans arrive, they burn it and they regularly burn it so that they can garden it. And it's a very good environment for gardens and the archeology span supports that. And then sometime above this line is when the massacre event occurs and the Pahutakawa takes over and reinvades the archeology. span Now, the, the charcoal here shows you that evidence. So this is microscopic charcoal and then different scales of it. But the microscopic charcoal you can see prior to this period of time, essentially very little, but after this point, a lot. And you get in the big charcoal, you get these two spikes. Now, when I look at this thing here, you can see two spikes here. This one here relates to the first burn off of the island. This one here relates to that 1940s burn of the island. And in between, there's quite a lot of charcoal. And so we're divided into three groups, upper, middle and lower. And the, the lower layers, the, the, the species are Rimu, Totra, Matai, Pahutakawa, Cabbage Tree, Nikau, uh, Kawakawa, and Strebulus. And then the middle layer is full of charcoal, grass, bracken, and very little else. And then the later layers is full of Metrosiderus, which is Pahutakawa. And that's interpreted as being a proxy for human settlement and burning in the middle phase which is probably 500 years of occupation. So they were burning it regularly enough that the next level of regen plants weren't coming in. So you weren't getting the, the, uh, the, 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 the small shrubs. Okay, what about the Polynesian rat? Well, it's absent from both islands. Now it was commensal food for Polynesian settlers and their absence here is argued to initially reflect long-term low intensity use by a non-resident population. In other words, they have the rat for when they're where they're living and they eat it where they live and on the mainland is where they live. But on the island, it's just gardening. So you, if you're only gardening and not living, you don't need to introduce the curi for food. But later in prehistory, uh, island use uh, was high intensity and reflecting full habitation by Marian. And at that point in time, traditional knowledge had pretty quite clear that kiori were a, had a negative impact on mutton birds and gardens. And since mutton birds on the mainland had pretty much declined away to nothing because of rats, these island sources of mutton birds became more and more important. And so they, it looks like they deliberately excluded them from that later phase. So that's the interpretation there. The European pig is, uh, at, uh, we have pig is absent in pre-European New Zealand, but it was found on Aorangi, but not Tafiti Rahi in the Poor Knights group. And, and there's a really interesting story about that, which would take far too long. But essentially, Governor King gave pigs to Tuki when he sent them back to New Zealand. 
But from correspondence between King and Tukey, he didn't have a viable population until 1805. And he, because King wanted to set up a provisioning trade for Māori. There were no pigs on Tafiti Rahi at all. And that may reflect the importance of mutton bird resources there, or possibly just variability and hapu connections. Pigs on Aorangi kept, uh, uh, went feral after 1823, and uh, they kept the understory open. And so the scientists who went to these islands focused nearly totally on Aorangi because they could actually see something there. And they weren't eradicated until 1936. So the absence of pigs on Tafiti Rai resulted in impenetrable thickets until the Pūtakawe canopy formed in 1940. So environmental science. Burning is consistent with anthropogenic action. It is not a natural occurrence. While you do get occasional fires from lightning strike, you don't get 500 years of charcoal. So the catchment of for pollen and charcoal covers all of Tafiti Rahi and is consistent with Māori settlement. So when? Anthropogenic burning occurs regularly, probably less if the gardens would have been season, uh, used and, and that you'd move around in different gardens, but every garden would have been reused within 10 years. It's contemporaneous with the Kahara volcanic eruption. So we know that these gardens occurred at, essentially at the beginning of settlement. Burning continues without a discernible break up until 1823 when the Pohutakawa recovers and people abandon the islands. The absence of kiore on the island implies human settlement either deliberately excluded kiore or it was short term and late in prehistory. In other words, they didn't need too early and they deliberately didn't do late. The presence of burnt pig bone on Tafiti Rahi in the cave site and a breeding colony only on the adjacent Aurangi islands of, of, of these, these lovely Bulashewa waters confirms Maori used use continued into the early historic period. So why? Vegetation change and the presence of charcoal is a proxy for Māori land clearance. And we have a conservative one to 10 year cycle of anthropogenic burning. Okay. So let's have a look at the archeology, span which was my thing. Just to put it in a context, these are early Polynesian sites around the coast based on the material culture. So it's not inconsistent with people based on this coast coming out to the islands. We had a number of archaeological sites recorded in the past, but because prior to GPS, it was very, very hard to map these islands because the archaeology patterns used to repeat. And uh, uh, and while people would draw lovely maps, you were never quite sure where they were. The types of archaeology we're finding is earth and stone features. And you can see these walls and stone-faced terraces, mounds, and, and various platforms and structures. This is a map that I produced on the island just to give you a flavor of the complexity of what's going on. Here you've got these long linear rows and then you've got these terraces and then you've got these stone mounds and the terraces here dropping down to here. Some of them are stone faced and some of them are not. And each of these had to be, um, uh, 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 had to be put into a GIS system after we mapped it. So, we were, you were using tape and compass on the ground, and then we were GPSing 100 meter by 100 meter blocks to get the map that we have today. So what we managed to record was um, uh, over 1,681 uh, features, earthwork and stone features, and 1,566 portable material culture with both lithics and faunal wood and uh, other material. And that's what it sort of looks like when the GIS is pulled out to the extreme. We summarized it here into various material. So the green is what I'm arguing is horticultural areas. The brown are habitation areas. The silver are specialist areas, while the red are ceremonial areas. The streams are, uh, we call them permanent, but there are very little water on the island due to the nature of the water falling through the islands. So as you can see, quite a few gardens. We look at the central area called Pukituaho. Uh, here's about a, as you can see, this is about 200 meters long. This is a kidney shaped area right in the center, which has got a stream here, lots of living terraces here, and then these gardening terraces around here. So, um, and then you start to see some of these stone rows turning up that are the core of a garden. This high point here had a burial at the top that we found, and it was behind this this stone wall here 
And but the gardens are the real key area. So let's have a look at this one and we can deconstruct how they worked. So here's this stream running through here. This is the material culture. There's like five artifacts found here. Gardens don't have artifacts. And that's important when we're arguing that the place was a garden long before it was settled. Then if we start putting in the stone rows, which are both functional and social boundaries for the uh, for different families having these strips of land in between. And then we put in the stone mounds, and then we put in the stone facings, and then we put in areas that had not yet been cleared of stone. And then we put in the green terraces, which are interpreted as garden terraces. And then we have our habitation terraces. And then we have retaining riveted walls and stuff. Some of these stone walls are in remarkably good condition. They've been trees are the only things that have damaged them. Essentially, with the with the with the massacre event on the island, the 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 island was abandoned literally overnight and was never occupied again. And so these stone rows, which have large stones on the outside and small in the middle, are very very well preserved. So it's one of the few places where we can actually study these features not only in, in their preservation, but also how they were being expanded at the time. But that's another story. We did a series of excavations. There was the cave site down here, the, um, the, the carver site here, uh, and then a few small things in these gardens that were tried. But I'm going to limit myself to talking about a few of these. This is the cave site. Um, it's uh, uh, hiding away. This is the only cave on this island, and tradition talks about Hori Wehi Wehi being spirited away to this cave in 1823. And that's consistent with the material that we found, which on the surface included historic material in the form of cooked pig bone. This is a plan view of the cave, and we did various uh, uh, surface clearing and various excavations and what we were finding inside it. And in particular, we, we found that we, we would get uh, the pig bone turned up on the top. And we found these gourd seeds, bottle gourd seeds, right down at, uh, at the bottom. And these have been dated to 1560 plus or minus 30. So about 400 years of history here, but not much with uh, interspersed with uh, classic cave debris, which is uh, sterile, but with it a lot happening at the top, which is a recent historic. So then we had a, another excavation on a, uh, a Kumra pit here that was on a terrace. That's, that's the Kumra pit there. And then this was a, a lithic area where there was a work floor for obsidian. And what we found with this terrace was that the, uh, the, this is the plan view of the part of the drain on the inside of the, uh, of the, the Kumra pit. But everything from here up was disturbed by the burrowing seabirds who basically rotary hoed the whole island. And a lot of obsidian was found on this island. And the way the birds re-excavate their burrows every year, the obsidian ends up floating on the surface, which is quite interesting. That just happens to be that same kidney-shaped hill that I showed you early on, just showing you because it's such a beautiful piece of archaeology. So... And here at the top is this stone wall with the burial behind it, and the burial is found here. And in New Zealand Māori culture, we we have this distinction between tapu and noa. And tapu is like burials and things like that, and noa is food. And what we found is below this wall, we would find shellfish midden debris, but above it, we found nothing like that. So this is probably, and it's in keeping with with our understanding of Māori society at the time of Cook, this was a barrier, a cultural barrier between tapu and noa. So here's the wall here, and that little section was the, the excavation we did. And what looked like a terrace behind this wall was, for the most part, duff from the Pahutakawa, but there is the burial. People put burials to lay claim to places. So this is just a comparison of the features versus the material culture. And there is a clear correlation between the, uh, uh, the, the occupation terraces as opposed to the garden terraces. Artifacts are generally not found in the gardens. On the last day of the excavation, one of the uh, weed team who was on the island from Dock came across this carving. It's called a fakairo or carving. And 
uh, the gentleman to the, the these are senior kaumatua with Ngāti Wai. The gentleman to the right is Tiwaraki Hetaraka, who is the master carver. And his father was a master carver, and he used to keep the old skills of making stone tools alive. And he told me that these uh, spirals are carved with stone tools, and there's a Manaya figure here. Um, and this would have been part of a barge board on the end of a of a like a meeting house that we would understand today if you saw a marae or a, or a chief's house and this manaya figure on the end but what's interesting is that on the back of this are sockets to attach it to the building and those have been carved with metal tools so the the carving of this artifact straddles the period of european arrival so let's have a talk about portable material culture from these came, so you've got things like your sandy shellfish. We have none of that there. So it's one of those absent scenarios. And uh, you can find it on the coast here. So here and here in Whangarei and here at Fononaki. Onorahi chert is one of the chert lithics. We find that in Whangarei. And that maybe is consistent with the fact that Tatatua's wife, Te Onoho, came from there. Dolorite comes from Whangarei, and that's for making of adzes. Mokahino obsidian was found. We found uh, four pieces of Mokahino obsidian. Te Ahumata obsidian is um, uh, one of the source, two sources in Great Barrier, and we found a few pieces of that. Uh, Tangihua gabbro, and this is a very hard rock that makes adzes in the later phase of Maori settlement. And of course, we have localized Rako, Muttonbird, and Kumra. So Mare Island obsidian is found on the island, but in very small amounts. So um, the obsidian that is found on this island, 99% is a local source that comes probably from Great Barrier, um, but we're not quite sure where it is. And so, uh, so let's talk about what this means in terms of a timeline. So here on the left, we've got history, vegetation, and archaeology. And we're sort of putting them in a chronology from 100 AD through to 1900 AD. So if we start with history, you could see that the islands were named after islands back in the Pacific. So that's got to be in the first hundred years of occupation, around 1300. There's a reference to an ancestor to Tatua called Panoa a few generations back, probably somewhere around here, maybe around 1700. And then Tatua was the first and only chief to live on the island, and he was still there in 1822-23. So he had to have been there in his living days. So you'd be hard pressed to put it before 1800. So you've got early settlement, early naming, late settlement. Interesting. And then that ends with Reverend Hall's report of the attack in December 1823. That's a typo. But if we look at the vegetation and the anthropogenic burning, it occurs from 1300 all the way through to 1823 with the abandonment. So gardening is unchanged throughout that period of time. If it had been abandoned, we would have had different plants and we're not seeing it. So then we have the archaeology, which in the cave site, we have the, the good seeds here, and then we have the historic period, uh, material here. So mid to late. Then Mare Island Obsidian is effectively absent from the island. And so, as I said to you before, early sites should have Mare Island Obsidian. So why aren't we finding it? Kiori are absent, which suggests for various reasons I've gone into the, uh, that that the, the, that that suggests it's a late phase. And then we get cooked pig bone in the cave, which has got to be post 1800. And then we get that carving, which is, uh, you know, somewhere between 1780s and 1820s, really. So you get some really interesting um, uh, divisions of what's going on. So what does this mean? So we know it's Ngāti Wai from the mainland with connections out into a wider tribal territory. We know from the carbon dates from the pollen that human-induced change in the island's vegetation started around about 1350, which is about as early as you can get in New Zealand, just at the time when Polynesian colonists were arriving in New Zealand. And this change continued through the, to the historic period. Excavation dates confirm the presence of cultigens by 1550, and that's the, the, the good seeds but also show the bulk of the archaeological material recovered was deposited quite late in prehistory or early in protohistory. It, it, it is interesting that these dates sort of bookend New Zealand's archaeological trajectory, and it's also reflected in the island's traditional history. On one hand, the islands were named 
specifically after islands in the Pacific. And um, they were chosen early because they reminded people of ancestral islands. And that sort of knowledge would have gone out of use very quickly. So it's got to be early. On the other hand, the one and only chief reported to have occupied Tafiti Rahi must have gone there late in prehistory because he was still alive in 1823. So what does this mean? Well, the research suggests that these islands changed in use over time. Our argument is initially they were peripheral locations used as garden outliers for mainland populations. And that would explain why there's no Mare Island obsidian, because you don't need obsidian tools in gardens. Later, however, they became independent horticultural-based settlements at a time when intertribal conflict was becoming endemic. Māori presence on the islands continued into the historic era, and the presence of European source pigs on the southern islands suggested they were engaging in the provisioning trade after the encouragement from Governor King. And that's the first big trade we have in the north, in anywhere in New Zealand, that's with the whaling fleets. Occupation only ceased after a competing tribe attacked and depopulated the islands in 1823. So let's just review this one more time. History is ambivalent about the timing of occupation. It's clear about that the island was used for gardening, mutton birding, fishing, and defense by uh, and uh, anthropogenic, anthropogenic uh, anth so earth science as a proxy for anthropogenic activity has human presence from the start of New Zealand prehistory extending into the historic period. Archaeology shows complex late phase pre-European Maori settlement with the expected range of site types focused around gardens. Dates from the cave, start 1550, and then there's a gap, and then significant activity in historic times supported by obsidian. This can be understood if we realize that the nature of human activity changed over time. So the model here is consistent with all the different databases. Early on, our peripheral locations are utilized as garden outliers for mainland populations. And in these early days, when you have small populations that were highly mobile, they did probably the opposite of intensification. They would have come to the island and burnt it. And then on another day, they would have planted it. And on another day, they would have harvested it. And they had more places to garden than they can shake a stick at. And that's all you need to do early on. Later, independent horticultural-based settlements occurred on the islands. And it was at a time when intertribal conflict was becoming endemic. So that's when the villages turn up and the gardens probably get a lot more complex to try and increase productivity. In the historic period, uh, the, the Maori presence continued. European pigs on the Southern Island suggest they're engaging in the provisioning trade because islands are great places for pigs. Otherwise you've got to track them down. An occupation only ceased after a competing tribe attacked. So it is argued that these events reflect changing economic, social, and ritual realities in mainland-based Maori societies. It's important to note that they're not isolated, separate, but they are constrained. So the Poor Knights Islands were always part of a tribal territory that was connected by sea. You can see them from the mainland. Actual usage of this territory, however, was contingent on what was happening on the mainland. And so this changed over time in archaeologically recognizable ways. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, James. Um, if anybody has a question, you can either use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen to raise your hand, or you could pop a question in the chat if you would prefer to do it that way. Could I stop sharing, Siobhan? Uh, yeah, that'd be fine. I don't know if you can see the chat, James, but if you unshare, you may be able to. I can see some chats. Thank you, Deb. I think one of the key points is that you can actually, because of the constraints of islands, you can actually do stuff here that's harder to do on the mainland. Like we know on the mainland, rats were introduced and then they went feral and they went all over the place. So we don't know where they were introduced and where they weren't introduced, but they definitely went all over the place. So it's only these islands which didn't have rats that you can start putting some of these presence and absence arguments together. Is that why you picked those islands, James? I mean, <laughs> partly because they're islands, but also because um, their history and their archaeology hadn't really been looked at? Um, yeah, it was one of those confluences of things. I'd worked for the Department of Conservation and my boss at the time, Joan Mingy, 
had put together a functional strategy for history and had identified that we really didn't understand these islands very well at all because the previous archaeology uh, on the islands had really been hamstrung by the lack of GPS. So since we had GPS, it seemed us to, uh, timely to start it. So I did a couple of field trips. And what we found is every time we did a field trip, we'd find more and more archaeology. So uh, when I decided that uh, I needed to actually do something a bit more serious about Northland archaeology and did my PhD, um, this was the obvious choice. And I had relationships with Ngāti Wai Trust Board and Department of Conservation and managed to get uh, 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 an agreed um, system for, for working there. And so, uh, 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 and, and it allowed us to, because I had been doing a lot of difficult landscape survey work, uh, allowed us to sort of come up with techniques for dealing with the difficulties. And um, what we were finding was that we could um, use uh, just standard handheld GPS, although there was the plus or minus 10 to 15 meter error, um, your error was not accumulating. And so the, we managed to actually make sense out of the whole island. Um, it, it it had been, un, people hadn't been focusing on this island because it had been so hard to get onto it. To the extent where the early European ethnographer, uh, Fraser, thought there was no archeology span on the island at all. But what it turns out is that they had more archeology span than anyone can, can see. So, Wandering around in this environment, it seemed like uh, let's do something with this because we can actually start to engage with those bigger questions in archaeology. And it was consistent with the policy we had in the Department of Conservation of when someone says, here's a, here's a reserve, let's get the history together. And uh, you take whatever you can get and you're not fussy about it. So it was one of those uh, patterns of use where you look at any history, palynology, anything that can tell you about the past and try and make some sense out of it. And uh, lucky enough to have a, an intact archeological landscape. So we end up with this archeological landscape that not only um, is it probably contemporary, so all those component parts are contemporary with each other within a 20 year period, but when they're not obscured by defensive par architecture, which it is on the mainland, because the, basically the cliffs uh, provided that, that protection. It also allowed us to engage with certain stories that turn up in the traditional history. One of the stories was that the, the inhabitants used to roll their canoes up the cliff because there's literally no beach or any place to land them. And it didn't make sense with 200 meter tall cliffs, but there is one particular place near to the main landing site, which only has a 10 meter cliff. And there is a very interesting archeological terrace behind it with unique archeology. span So, you know, that plus the single cave with the stories about it, you start to get some interesting uh, uh, ability to sort of engage with these stories. The interpretation I've given may not be correct, but it is consistent with the data that we have today. And so I think that's about the best you can hope for, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for that, James. Um, um, are you able to see the chat? There are a few questions oh. popping up in the chat now. Could you could you um, read them to me? I'm not seeing them. And well, uh, what I what I do, I might call out the questioners and get them to ask sure. their own yep. questions. Absolutely. The first one that I can see there is from Anne. Sorry, I had to unmute. I was just <laughs> I was just wondering what the act I've missed it. I think as to what the walls on the islands were actually for. So most of those long linear rows and mounds are to do with gardening. And we find them in a number of places around the north, uh, Stonefield Gardens associated with vol volcanism. And so it's, a, it's a, a, a way to make use of the lovely silty volcanic soil that occurs in and around them. So uh, the, the, the wall at the top of the hill is actually a physical boundary, while some of the stone rows are like sort of short, wide that long but wide and thick walls. So essentially we're dealing with stone architecture, what you can do with them. The stone was used in a number of ways. So when they cleared a land and, uh, and you see those stone mounds, they were growing between the mounds, but they're also growing on the mounds because uh, bottle goods in particular like growing in that environment. So they started to intensify their, their horticultural practices. Um, but the thing about 
uh, tribal society here is it's not state level. They don't have standardized weights and measures. They don't, it's not like Machu Picchu where everything's built the same way. What you find is they've got this kit, these toolkits of using earth and using stone, and they use them in clever ways. But they, they use the same things to make garden terraces and also occupation terraces. And there's uh, subtleties in the archaeology that will tell you things about it. So it's a it's an interesting uh, landscape. Of when you don't have volcanic soils with stone, it's often much harder to see the archaeology. Does that answer your question, Anne? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And our next question was from Letitia. If if you're able to unmute yourself, Letitia. She may have vanished. Oh dear. We may, we may have lost someone. Anyway, the, the, can you see the chat there, James? Um, no, not at the moment. Could you read it? Okay. She She's thanking you, but she's got a question, which is, did you find any, is it Cara, Cara, Caraca? Uh, Caraca, uh, as in, uh, no, there's no Caraca trees on uh, on Tafiri Rahi. Um it's got a quite a, a limited uh, vegetation because it it was it regrew back from because it was mostly devegetated during occupation by Maori, so it doesn't have kuraka. It does have re, uh, it does have a um, the, the 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 various species there. It's starting to have a little bit of kauri, um, uh, but but no kuraka, which is interesting because kuraka is often associated with uh, Maori settlement. But in this particular instance, it's not. I sort of postulated that when you live on this island, there's certain things that you don't have, and you go back to meet your whanaungatanga, uh, your, your relatives on the mainland regularly. And sometimes you get angry and you have fights, but often you're going back. And the last thing you want in a proud uh, uh, tribal society is to be a poor relative. And so you don't have Totra, for example, on the island, and yet you need it for the fences and the buildings. So what can you do to provide something that uh, the people on the mainland don't have? And that's going to be mutton birds. So I suspect they became very, very important later on. It's uh, in Maori society, when people die, there's a tangi. It's like an Irish wake. And you always bring something to the table. And in the early 1900s, they... The, the 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 informants to um to Fraser talked about the mutton bird being large and tasty and it was the it became I think the special product from this island so so constraints and opportunities yeah that makes sense thank you James um Ella I can see that you're still with us so perhaps you could unmute and ask your question hi um thanks James that was a great talk um just a quick question about um, the what criteria did you use to discriminate between the horticultural versus the living terraces that you recorded? So um, some of them are difficult to, de to determine. And the primary uh, uh, distinction was the presence or absence of artifacts. And there was quite a dramatic difference between the presence and absence of artifacts. Um, uh, but I, I do admit that the definition change between those two is uh, uh, you have to, to work at it. So we did in our excavations on garden terraces, they did have a consistent soil type, which didn't have uh, any, any fireplaces or anything inside it. And it did have a hard pan, which in this case was mostly the vol natural volcanic substrata subsoils, which is really important for Kumara production. But it's one of the classic problems in New Zealand archaeology that uh, we really struggle to differentiate where uh, where people were doing certain things. There is definitely historical evidence of using garden terraces. They tend to be a little bit bigger, but not always. Sometimes they have they use it for shooting certain plants. They get them to grow and then they plant them out. And because the kumara, which is the predominant crop, is harvested before it flowers. We don't have evidence of pollen. And because it's a tuber, unless it's been carbonized in some process, which is generally in, in, a, in, a, in an occupation site, you, you don't see it. So we really, we really struggle around this. It's clear that they were gardening, because those are classic garden fields uh, with the stone mounds and things. 
And so the presence of those stone mounds and stone rows that I deconstructed earlier, that it shows us where stuff is, we think. But my interpretation is open to question in the in the detail, I think, Ella. Thanks. Um, just quickly, though, what about starch residues? So we've, we've, in New Zealand, we struggle with starch residues because um, so many of the natural plants produce starch as well. And we need to get a database that's consistent that we can use to say, well, this is definitely a cultigen. And while there have been some arguments in New Zealand that, uh, that that can be done, it hasn't yet got a database that's really uh, that's really stands up to the test because starch grains basically are globular and um, uh, pollen on the other hand for example is, is unique to each individual species and uh, different distinct shapes so we're really struggling with that what I was trying to do which was unsuccessful at the time was to get plant DNA because if I'm correct uh, the plants that would have been on this island would have probably been tropical cultigens that they came from the Pacific and if we could have a, a, a DNA study uh, of remnants in the ground, maybe we could identify those. And Landcare Research was working on that with uh, uh, Jamie was working there, but sadly we couldn't actually find uh, anything at the time to make that, that work. But it's one of the key things in New Zealand archeology, span if we can get garden DNA going uh, as opposed to, to starch grain or, or um, micro uh, phytoliths and stuff would be really great. Thanks, James. It's my last call to anyone um, for questions. Oh, Tristan, yes. You'll need to unmute yourself, though. Yep. Uh, kia ora, James. Uh, G'day, Tristan. As usual. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering about the, the sort of post um, 19th century sort of uh, occupation. Like, when, when did the pigs come off, I guess, and how did it um, come to be in? Uh, it, it's it's in Doc's hands now, I take it? Yes. So the post-1900 history is quite interesting. Essentially, the people were looking for where the bull of shearwater was breeding because they'd found it off Calif on the Californian coast, but they didn't know where it was breeding. And then the scientists sort of discovered it around about 1900, that it was on the poor nights, and they got very excited about it. Um, the From 1823 through to 1900, Māori were occasionally... Uh, were, were fishing in the area, but they were not living on the islands. And this is partly because of the tapu that was placed there after the massacre, but also because of the extreme levels of, 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 of disease that were occurring in that period of time from the 1820s through to the 1900, which caused serious population decline, significant population decline. So then the European scientists started to place a European tapu on the place to try and protect these rare and endangered species. Mm -hmm. And they did that mostly on Aorangi and they they worked really hard to get them designated as a as one of the very first uh, scientific reserves, you know, for, for nat natural values. So the islands never really got used. Um, the, 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 the main use of the islands was as a fishery and the, 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 the value of this very high biomass of fish um, led in the, the, the 1970s and 80s for it to be designated as a marine reserve, as, as well as the nature reserve that it always was. But nobody lived on the island. Nobody went back to the island. Nobody did anything on this island uh, for a while. The pigs on Aorangi, which changed the revenge, uh, were periodically shot off at the direction of scientists who were trying to protect the nat nat natural values. But it wasn't until Captain Xerox went there in 1936 and killed the last of the last seven pigs and finally stopped them recovering. The bodies of these pigs are still available on the island. Uh, and uh, 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 it, it, so it was where they fell. You can actually find those places. Um, so it's been an interesting sort of, uh, you end up with this island that's got a really classic Māori architecture, uh, very early occupation, continuous use. It sort of pushes out of the window the idea that Māori didn't garden much in the early days because they had mowers to eat, which is a, 
lovely simplistic explanation because they were gardening in this really peripheral island, very hard to get to, from the early days. Um, and then then it basically fell out of use except for for occasional people. So the in its and then then because of the the nature of the revegetation, Tafadi Rahi couldn't actually be easily visited until the the canopy formed and the understory started to clear out. And interestingly, between my first visit there in 1999 and my last visit there in 2008, the visibility had sort of moved roughly from a five meter visibility to maybe an eight meter visibility. So it was clearly actually working. So uh, things are changing as we speak. Mm. So that's great. Thanks, Josh. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Okay, look, um, thanks very much, James, for sharing your knowledge. And um, it was a great talk. Um, great to kick off our first one for 2024 um, with that case study of yours. Um, and for everybody else, thank you very much also for coming to the ASHA seminar and keep a look out on our Facebook and Twitter and we're on Instagram and threads as well. Um, and um, you'll see the upcoming events and the rest of the seminar series uh, being posted on there as they become available. Um, but thank you very much for attending tonight and uh, we look forward to seeing you either in person or virtually at another ASHA event. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, everyone.